let me move on and introduce today's speaker. So we're very happy to have Jairo Velasco from uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. And, and for those of you who are not familiar with Jairo, let me very briefly introduce him. So he got his PhD 2012 from University of California, Riverside, uh, working in the group of uh, Jenny Lau. And, and the, the, the title of the thesis was, I think it was three is larger than two is larger than one investigation of single particle uh, and many body physics in dual gated one, two, three layers of graphene. So working on these graphene devices. Then he moved on for a postdoc with Mike Promick at UC Berkeley from 2012 and to 2015. And since 2015, he's been at the UC Santa Cruz, first as an assistant professor and since 2021 as an associate professor. And um, OK, we're going to hear, of course, more about their work today, but the, the group basically uh, aims to characterize and manipulate the properties of two dimensional materials with unprecedented sensitivity and atomic scale precision using low temperature scanning tunnel microscopy and, and also advanced nanofabrication techniques. And, and the title of uh, Jairo's talk today is Imaging Atomically Thin Quantum Devices at the Nanoscale. And with that, we very much look forward to your talk and, and the floor is yours. Okay, well, uh... Hello, everyone. And yes, thank you, uh, Professors Peter and Jose, for the invitation to speak today in this uh, virtual colloquium series. Uh, for those who are just joining, my name is Jairo Velasco, Jr. I'm an associate professor of physics at UC Santa Cruz. And today, I will give an overview of my group's recent research on probing monolayer graphene, bilayer graphene, and trilayer graphene electronic states that could be potentially leveraged for future quantum devices. Here on the title slide, you see um, an example of such states. We have trapped electrons in bilayer graphene. So these are two sheets of graphene uh, stacked together and offset. What we did here is we engineered a confinement structure, a circular confinement structure that enables the trapping of bilayer graphene electrons in the study of their quantum interference. So my goal by the end of the talk today is that you'll understand some of the properties of these, of these interesting electronic states in, in quantum devices consisting of graphene and its multilayers. So let's begin. Throughout the history of human civilization, mastery of materials has been a catalyst for significant technological advancements. Here I list a few examples where I include different materials on the left and different elements of mastery for each material that facilitated significant societal events on the far right here. So mastery with metallurgy was a major contributing factor for the industrial revolution depicted here. Uh, mastery with the passivation and control of silicon enabled silicon-based field effect transistors which are the fundamental component of the electronic devices that are so prevalent in our everyday lives, right? So these devices, we, we depend so much on these days, right? Now, this is often referred to as the first quantum revolution or the digital revolution. Well, currently we are in the midst of a new revolution that is fueled by uh, quantum materials. Here I show an example of one quantum material. And the idea here is that the manipulation and harnessing of quantum states posted in these materials has the potential to revolutionize computation, sensing, storage, and communications, thus affecting multiple facets of our society. Additionally, from a fundamental standpoint, the harnessing and manipulation of quantum states could also be used to develop novel simulators, as depicted here, that allow the exploration of new physics or potential solving of uh, very difficult unsolved problems. Overall, this is a major research effort referred to as quantum information science and engineering, QISC. And my group's research overlaps with this effort by focusing on fundamental studies of novel 2D material-based quantum devices. So we mostly overlap with um, these blue shaded regions here. So uh, new types of sensors and advancing 
understanding of 2D material platforms that could be used for uh, quantum computation in the future. Okay. And so this is what I'll be discussing today. And well, in, in the future, I could see uh, the platform that I'll be discussing today could also be used to develop uh, new types of quantum simulators. All right. So the quantum device I'll focus on today is a quantum dot. It can be used as a quantum sensor and a qubit for quantum computation. It has several strengths compared to other platforms such as high tunability, uh, it's scalable, and it's highly integrable. A quantum dot can be thought of as a region where charges are confined, um, as depicted here. This confinement gives way to discretized states that can be accessed through control voltage, such as a uh, voltage one could apply to the source and drain, or uh, a voltage, uh, a gate voltage, which is uh, a voltage that's not in direct contact with our uh, quantum dot. Now, the conductance through this system has a distinct signature that can be leveraged for sensing. Um, this sensitivity to the environment, such as the local electric fields, however, make it a poor qubit because a prepared quantum state can be easily lost. If we focus on one quantum state and we apply a magnetic field, this leads to spin split states. And this quantum system is better suited for a qubit because these states can be more robust to external stimuli such as electric fields. Okay, so we have, this could be a sensor and this could be a qubit. Now there's a rich history and strong current experimental effort that uses uh, conventional semiconductors such as gallium arsenide and silicon as material platforms for quantum devices. Here I list just a few reviews uh, for you to uh, look into later. My presentation today will focus on quantum dot devices based on graphene and its multilayers. And then the next slides, what I'll do is I'll discuss some of the strengths that uh, carbon-based uh, materials possess for quantum device, quantum dot devices. So here's a very practical strength um, that applies to uh, many 2D materials. Here I'm going to focus on uh, carbon-based 2D materials. So graphene and many uh, 2D materials are promising for future quantum devices because they're scalable. Here I show a scalable process for graphene synthesis known as chemical vapor deposition, which works in the following way. Uh, you have, you use electrochemical polishing to clean and smooth the metal substrate. You then use heating and annealing to reduce nucleation sites and enlarge the grain size of your metal substrate. Next, you use high temperature growth um, to grow graphene. And so what occurs here is that you have uh, a surface reaction with a carbon carrying gas as shown. And this is how you get large films of, of graphene and its multilayers. Below here, I show a roll to roll scheme that uses uh, CBD as a synthesis step with additional steps that are automated to produce graphene films with high throughput. Overall, this field is a, is a fascinating field where researchers are constantly innovating the quality of their graphene films that are synthesized and the synthesis efficiency. Okay, so this shows how these ma materials can be scalable. Now there are additional strengths for graphene um, that pertain to its material properties. So I'll move on to discuss that. So first, uh, carbon is a light element. And so its spin orbit coupling is reduced significantly. Additionally, graphene can be synthesized with high purity. Therefore, hyperfine interactions are reduced. Now, these are two prominent dephasing mechanisms in quantum dots made for materials such as gallium arsenide and silicon. So graphene quantum dots are an attractive alternative to these systems because of their greater immunity to these dephasing mechanisms. In addition, something that's unique to these materials. So in some graphene systems, they host orbital magnetic moments originating from finite Berry curvatures in the K and K prime valleys as shown in this uh, diagram. Uh, these moments are located near the conduction band minimum and they present a unique opportunity for the manipulation of different types of quantum states 
and the realization of value-based qubits. It is expected that these quantum states will be more immune to the above the phasing mechanisms here. All right. Now, because of these interesting properties, there's been significant experimental efforts with the development of graphene quantum dots, uh, specifically bilayer graphene quantum dots recently. Uh, advancements with sample fabrication have, um, in addition with researchers having the capability of populating electronic states within a bilayer graphene quantum dot and controlling the spin and value degrees of freedom, have really made this field very exciting uh, to watch. Here I show some of the more recent results um, where um, researchers have really pushed the, the frontier. So this is work by the, the Enslin and Stanford groups at ETH and Aachen respectively. Um, the, the approach that these groups use is low temperature transport. And what they're tackling here are really important questions for quantum information science, and, um, applications for, for graphene systems. They've uh, measured the spin relaxation in bilayer graphene quantum dots and also are at advanced understanding on how to read value information in bilayer graphene quantum dots. Now, my group contributes to this exciting field of research by studying the local properties of quantum dot devices made from graphene and its multi layers. Our STM and scanning tunneling spectroscopy characterization is complementary to our colleagues in the transport community and aims to provide a comprehensive picture of atomically thin quantum devices. And that's what I'll discuss uh, moving forward. So uh, uniquely what I'll show you is that the STM is a powerful tool, not just for the characterization of quantum dot devices, but also for the fabrication of these devices as well. Okay, so before I discuss my group's uh, graphene-based quantum dot devices, I'll show you how we make and treat our samples. So here's the instrument in my group. It's a Createch scanning tunneling microscope. It operates at a temperature of about 4.7 Kelvin and an ultra high vacuum. It's equipped with two chambers, a preparation chamber and a STM chamber. Uh, we perform sample annealing in this chamber and um, we then transfer our sample into the STM to do our experiment. The instrument is housed in a soundproof room and possesses a two Tesla perpendicular magnetic, or two Tesla magnetic field that's oriented perpendicular to the sample. We use a long uh, lens telescope camera to visualize the tip sample junction. So this is what I'm highlighting here. I hope you could see my cursor. And so what you could see here is the uh, tip and uh, our, our header structure here, we have a bilayer graphene on hexagonal bore nitride. This is the tip reflection. We have, um, to electrode source and drain, and this is all surrounded by uh, silicon dioxide. Okay, so our samples are made the old fashioned way, um, just uh, uh, stacking. So first we use uh, scotch tape to cleave uh, hexagonal bore nitride and um, bilayer graphene. So hexagonal bore nitride is an insulating 2D material. So we um, exfoliate this onto silicon dioxide chips. Uh, this is for the HBN. We exfoliate the bilayer graphene here on a polymer substrate. We then use the optical, um, um, an optical microscope to allow us to align these two and then mechanically uh, stamp them together. Okay, so here's a completed um, bilayer graphene hexagonal bore nitride heterostructure. All right, and the method we use is, is, is uh, detailed in this paper here. Now, clean surfaces and interfaces are very important for our measurements for all scan probe microscopy. Uh, we perform extensive um, cleaning uh, steps. So the first step we use is the mechanical sample cleaning step. Um, due to the inert nature of uh, graphene, it, you could have adsorbents that weakly decouple that weakly couple to the surface, as shown here. And our first step is to use an atomic force microscope in a glove box to essentially disengage these uh, weakly coupled adsorbents, as very nicely depicted here. So here are some results of this um, cleaning step. 
So this is an uh, AFM scan on the left here. Uh, we scanned, uh, we, we passed the tip several times in this rectangular region. This region out here has not been scanned with the AFM extensively. Um, and so we, we can zoom in on this region here and we find that um, there's a significant difference between uh, before and after uh, AFM tip sweeping, right? So the, the RMS roughness is, is much better after we do our treatment. Okay. okay. All right. So here's the measurement setup for our experiments. Uh, again, we have um, a graphene sheet um, or multi-layer graphene sheet on top of hexagonal bore nitride. Uh, we deposit a, a metal contact using a stencil mask. This all rests on a silicon oxide wafer, which is then followed by uh, dope silicon. So this, the dope silicon allows us to apply a gate voltage to tune the carrier density in our graphene film. Our STM tip is grounded and we apply our, our bias to our, our sample we use a modulation voltage to allow us to uh, do uh, point spectroscopy. Okay. And yes, what I'll show you are studies that interchangeably have monolayer graphene and bilayer graphene or trilayer graphene here. All right. So I've told you how we uh, assemble our heterostructure and how we treat it to improve the sample cleanliness. Now I'm gonna show you how we make our quantum dot in that heterostructure, okay? So we have um, here graphene or multi-layer graphene in this purple slab here. It's followed by hexagonal bore nitride, which is then followed by silicon oxide and then dope silicon. What we do is we apply a voltage pulse with our STM tip. And what this does is it essentially um, ionizes charges uh, or defects in the underlying hexagonal bore nitride. We can then use our gate electric field to guide these charges away. And so we're left with um, charge defects. Essentially what this is, it's an embedded uh, local uh, gate uh, beneath the graphene, which can then locally dope graphene above. Okay, so this is, this is the end result. And while this, this method is uh, very well suited for uh, scan probe microscopy because it does not require additional fabrication. In fact, you could carry this out in your STM chamber or you know, SPM setup. So it doesn't compromise the sample cleanliness. You have uh, clean surfaces and you have an exposed surface to do um, uh, your measurements. So this was developed by my colleagues um, and, and I at, at UC Berkeley several years ago, and it's been adapted by several groups. Uh, some are listed here, but uh, there are additional ones as well. Okay, so now I'll discuss my group's recent work on monolayer graphene quantum dots. What I'll show you is that we developed uh, a new type of quantum dot sensor uh, that leverages the unique properties of uh, monolayer graphene. Okay, so I'll discuss the unique properties in, in monolayer graphene that we use. So in graphene, electrons follow the Dirac equation. So shown here. So this is the relativistic analog of the Schrodinger equation. And um, this gives rise to many interesting properties, actually. So we can consider um, um, a rectangular potential barrier as shown here with this black uh, line. And interestingly, for, um, for the Dirac equation, we could realize a state where electrons um, undergo 100% transmission across this potential barrier. Okay, this is known as Klein tunneling and had been studied in general for many years and was studied um, specifically for graphene in this very uh, important paper listed here. Okay. So off normal, what, what this uh, paper showed is that off normal, so when the electrons encounter the barrier off normal, um, you have a, a drastic reduction of the transmission of the electrons. And so this enables you to trap um, the uh, relativistic graphene electrons. Okay, so very quickly, why does this come about? Well, we could just compare this to the right. This is the, the Schrodinger equation. So we know if we have a potential barrier, 
for our Schrodinger equation, electrons will just die off exponentially. Here in graphene, or rather any system that has this dispersion, what you have are negative energy states that enable uh, charges to um, transmit into. In addition, you have uh, this blue arrow, which depicts uh, pseudospin. So you have pseudospin conservation that tells you that you should have, um, you know, this, this uh, transition here is more favorable than going back, this transition here. Okay. So this intriguing material property enables novel quantum dot devices, which I'll focus on now in the next few slides. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, there was a question related still to the sample, um, sample, how to say, um, fabrication. So there's a question Do you anneal the sample in UHV after the nano grooming? And if yes, do contaminants migrate back to the area of interest? Okay, it's a very good question. So what we found is that if we carry out the following sequence, we get high yields and clean surfaces. Um, and it's it's and it's highly reproducible. So first, uh, we do an argon hydrogen anneal. Then we do the AFM tip cleaning, and then we bring our sample into our UHV system and we do the UHV anneal. Okay, and what we find is that by doing the sequence, we're more likely to have large uh, clean areas on our graphene and multilayer graphene films. If we do not include one of these steps, um, the, reproducibly, the reproducibility of, of clean areas is reduced. Okay, I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right, so because of Klein tunneling, or as I mentioned, because of Klein tunneling, when charges uh, strike the PN junction or this barrier uh, at normal incidence, um, they're going to escape. So this would correspond to um, states or trajectories that have low angular momentum, right? So these are going to escape so they could fade out. Um, we could also consider states uh, sh as shown here in these yellow trajectories. Uh, so these states have high angular momentum and uh, they encounter the barrier obliquely. And so they will they'll be long lived uh, long-lived states or quasi-bound states in this structure. So this is what we would expect from the uh, Klein tunneling picture that I discussed before. Uh, we could test this directly with STM, so we could perform point spectroscopy in the center of our structure and at the edge. So I show our, our DIDV uh, point spectros spectroscopy on the right here, so we have DIDV versus tip sample bias. And what we see is that we have much sharper uh, states for um, the states that live at the edge compared to the states in the center, right? So what this tells us is that the trapping time for the states at the at the edge is much longer than the states at the center, right? And you can see this by just applying the uncertainty principle and using the width of this these states as our delta E. Okay, all right. So I'll, I'll focus now on these. Uh, these states here that are long lived in our structure and show you our novel quantum dot device. Okay, so here what I have, uh, we're focusing here on the edge and I showed uh, point spectroscopy at increasing magnetic field. So we could focus on the red trace, which corresponds to zero magnetic field and sit here at the Fermi level. So here we see a strong peak as we increase the magnetic field, we see this peak begins to broaden and then eventually it splits. And as we keep increasing the magnetic field, um, the splitting increases. Okay, so this, you could see this is now two peaks in this light pink trace compared to one peak in this red trace. All right, so let's, so this is the response of these states to the magnetic field. Let's try to understand this further. So what we do is we measure DIDV as a function of uh, tip sample bias or energy along the quantum dot diameter. So imagine if you I'll just go back a second, if you drew a line across the diameter here of this structure. And what you see is the spatial resolution of these states, right? So 
uh, you have um, this envelope here. And within this envelope, you have this nodal uh, structure. Okay, and, all, on, and these measurements here are performing a constant magnetic field. So this is 0 0.2 Tesla. Okay, the data has a striking resemblance to the quantum harmonic oscillator, which you may have seen in undergraduate physics. Um, I guess some differences are these, these dimple-like features. And this results from the um, application of this magnetic field. This is the splitting that I showed you before. Now we could solve this analytically and it's been solved um, in, in previous works. One work is listed here and we could then uh, label the quantum dot states in terms of their quantum numbers. So here I just show a, a, set, a, a set of these states. So the first column corresponds to the principal quantum number and the second column corresponds to the angular quantum number. Okay. Now to study the magnetic field response of these states uh, more carefully, what we could do is we could uh, measure DIDV as a function of, of magnetic field at a specific point in this structure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna park my STM tip at 40 nanometers and crank up the magnetic field while I measure DIDV. And so this is what I see, okay. And I use the quantum dot, um, quantum state uh, labels acquired from these uh, from this plot here, and I've translated to the right. And so what you see is uh, very clear uh, splitting features for each state as we increase the magnetic field. Now, uh, notably in our STM experiment, we're able to um, interrogate individual quantum dot states uh, with different um, angular quantum numbers. So this is actually something that's not possible with transport and highlights the strength of STM for studying these type of devices. Okay, one more thing. What I show here is the second order derivative of DIDV, and this is done just to enhance the, the contrast of the features. Um, red here corresponds to a peak in DIDV and blue to a dip, All right? Okay. So how do we understand this? So this is our, our very simple picture um, to explain our experimental results th thus far. So in the absence of a magnetic field, uh, we have uh, these states that live at the edge, right? So this, uh, this uh, comes about because of Klein tunneling, right? We have longer lived states at the edge. And in the absence of a magnetic field, uh, we have time reversal symmetry. So that ensures that we should have states that go, um, that go counterclockwise and clockwise. We could define a corresponding orbital magnetic moment for these states. And um, we may be tempted to describe this orbital magnetic moment by using this relationship here, which we learned from our undergraduate studies, but this is not valid because these uh, electrons adhere to the Dirac equation, right? So we've come up with a very simple model to describe these states. This is shown here. So we consider an electron traveling at the end of this uh, ring with graphene's Fermi velocity, and this lowercase r corresponds to the radius of this trajectory. Okay. All right. So this actually gives a prediction for the orbital magnetic moment. So again, what we could think of this as, or we could frame this in the following way, what we have is Zeeman splitting of these orbital magnetic states. So in zero magnetic field, these, these states are degenerate, as we increase the magnetic field, these states are going to split and our delta E will be um, related to the orbital magnetic moment, uh, which we have a prediction for, and the magnetic field, which is what we're applying. And remember, delta E is something that we could measure. Okay, so I'll show you some analysis of our data where we'll be able to get the orbital magnetic moment and compare it to this very simple theory. But first, I just wanna zoom out and say that what we have here is, is a really interesting two-state system. It, it may look like the more conventional spin-based two-state system, right? But it's, it's not, it, it focuses, or it's based on these orbital magnetic moments, or you, you can think of the circulation direction of these currents, okay? And this is what we propose as the um, new type of magnetic field sensor, all right? Yeah, sorry, there's a question from the audience again. Oh, yes. Sure. Yeah, so could you please remark on whether the lattice vector match between graphene and HBN? 
affects your observations under the magnetic field, uh, particularly the Zeeman splitting. Thanks. Okay, this is a fantastic question. So um, we have not probed um, heterostructures in, in, in which graphene and hexagonal Bohr and nitride are aligned. And I believe that's the regime that the, the question pertains to. Um, in our samples, graphene and hexagonal Bohr and nitride are offset from each other. So there's, there's no more A in, in, in the samples that we've looked at. Um, and if, if we do have a more A, um, it's, it's very small wavelength or it, it, it's very, yeah, it's very small wavelength. So the graphene band structure remains intact. Okay. So indeed we are trying to uh, probe samples in which graphene and hexagonal boron nitride are aligned and um, that's going to modify the graphene band structure. Um, it's gonna create a small gap due to the breaking of inversion symmetry. And we think that will be a very interesting system to study. All right, I hope that answers the question. I'm going to continue. Uh, okay. All right, so here uh, we measure our, so yeah, so here we measure uh, the splitting energy for uh, different states, states that have different angular quantum numbers. So this is depicted by these colors. And this is the expression uh, that we could use to relate the orbital magnetic moment to our measurements. Again, delta E is what we're measuring. That's splitting energy. Magnetic field is what we're applying. And the orbital magnetic moment is what we're interested in extracting. And so we, we could see right away that the orbital magnetic moment, this would be the slope in this plot, is going to be largest for uh, states with largest uh, angular quantum number, right? So these are states that are farther out in the quantum dot. That's consistent. I mean, that 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 definitely makes sense. Uh, we can then so we'll replot this now as orbital magnetic moment versus angular quantum number. So the red trace here shows our experiment. So the results extracted, or the values of the orbital magnetic moment extracted from our experiment. The uh, gold, green, and blue plots show um, theory uh, for orbital magnetic moment. Uh, for different potential uh, profiles. That's what this K corresponds to, okay? And so we see here that the uh, orbital magnetic moment increases again with increasing uh, angular quantum number as we expect. It doesn't lie on one curve alone. Uh, it seems to encounter all three curves. And we believe that this comes about from uh, the just the experimental fact that the potential is, is not uh, a parabola, it's not a perfect parabola, it has some deviations from a parabola. So we think that explains this kind of scatter. Uh, nonetheless, we see that the orbital magnetic moment is increasing with angular quantum number. We could then compare uh, this to our simple theory, right? So I'll just remind you of our very simple theory. It's just an, uh, an electron traveling on this ring with graphene's Fermi velocity. And so from this, we can get uh, a value of 300 mu b, so this would correspond to uh, this radius, 35 nanometers would correspond to um, this angular quantum number, so 5.5. And so you see very nicely that it's uh, near uh, 300 mu b, okay? So our, our very simple theory here uh, aligns with, our, with, with what we're measuring for this orbital magnetic moment. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna move on. So um, that uh, was regarding the individual uh, monolayer graphene quantum dot. Well, now I'll discuss are some experiments in which we now coupled these monolayer graphene quantum dots. Okay, to do this, we perform two voltage pulses that are 150 nanometers apart. And this gives rise to the double quantum dot structure that is depicted here. We then, as we did before for the individual quantum dot, we study the magnetic field response in two regions. So at the edge and slightly inside uh, the left quantum dot. So here's data from region two. And again, what you see, this is uh, DIDV, second order derivative DIDV as a, as a function of tip sample bias and magnetic field. And again, what you see are these splitting features that increase in splitting with increasing magnetic field, okay? 
on the left here, I show now data or measurements on region one. So this is at the edge of the left structure. It's the same type of measurement. And we see interestingly a very different type of behavior, right? So we, we see now this is mostly flat, the response to the magnetic field. If you zoom in, you could see that there is a very slight uh, B squared um, dependence of the, of the shift um, of, 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 of the quantum dot states at this region. Okay. All right, so let's try to understand it. So, um, well, the way we could understand is the following. So if we look at region two, uh, so there we're, we're looking at, uh, we could depict these at the, as these circular, these green uh, circular trajectories. So in this uh, regime, these two states do not talk to each other. And so we would expect that we would get the magnetic field response of an individual quantum dot. And indeed, that's what we do, right? So we see splitting as we increase the magnetic field. Now, the story is different when we look at these uh, yellow rings. So uh, this, for these uh, yellow rings, we expect uh, we have now a strongly coupled uh, uh, quantum dot or double quantum dot system. This strong coupling leads to uh, this figure eight orbit, which has reversed uh, current in each segment, right? So this is clockwise in this segment and counterclockwise in this segment. Now the reverse current leads to orbital magnetic moments that point in opposite direction. And thus the, the net value of the orbital magnetic moment in the structure for, these yellow, for this yellow trajectory will be zero. Okay. Now there is a slight B squared dependence, which I, I show here. And so, uh, this can be attributed to a, a second order perturbative effect, which we believe uh, produces a Van Fleck paramagnetic correction. Now, notably, this is um, something unique of this relativistic system. So if you, if you think back to the non-relativistic case, there, uh, Larmar diamagnetic term, a B squared term will dominate. What we see here is that, um, in, in this case, we don't have, in the relativistic case, we don't have a, a B squared term. Um, we just, it's not dominating the, the response here. It just appears as a, as a slight perturbative effect, a slight correction. Okay. All right. Okay, so that's it for our monolayer graphene quantum dots. I'm gonna move on now to our bilayer graphene quantum dots. I guess this would be a good point if there are any questions regarding the monolayer graphene work. I'll just take a pause here. Well, I have maybe one question. Is there some reason why the visibility of the features is the best at zero bias? I mean, I guess they are somehow symmetric, but what, what gives you the amplitude? Yes, this is a very good question. So I'm just gonna backtrack a little bit here. For these scans, right, this bias versus magnetic field and DIDV, right? These type of scans. So these scans occur, if we go back here, they occur at, let's say, most of them that I've shown you occur, uh, have been taken at 40 nanometers. And you see the potential is parabolic. So the states turn away. When you get to this higher region, the states turn away from that 40 nanometer uh, point. If we had a, a square potential, right? If you then sat on one side, then you would get you wouldn't get this type of phenomenon. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Okay, great. Okay, I'll say one more thing here. This also this type of study also highlights the strength of STM to study these quantum dot devices. So, very interestingly, here we're accessing uncoupled states and coupled states, strongly coupled states in our double quantum dot structure. Um, you know, doing this in transport would be, I, I think. Uh, very difficult, right? But here in STM, we just position our tip in different regions of this structure. All right. Okay, so now I move on to discuss my group's work on bilayer graphene quantum dots. And so uh, burnout stack bilayer graphene is, uh, it, it just consists of carbon atoms arranged in a honeycomb uh, structure. It's a very uh, versatile and highly tunable quantum material as shown here. So um, what you get are parabolic bands. You get four bands, so two, two bands touch. 
you apply a perpendicular And this is at the heart of these bilayer graphene quantum dots because you could gap out um, the bilayer graphene system by applying a perpendicular electric field. You can very nicely use it to make uh, quantum dot devices. And so the state of the art is shown here. Um, this is, I believe, this is from the ETH group. So what they do is they uh, use a sequence of gates to isolate a region in bilayer graphene and. Um, essentially trap electrons in this region or holes in this region and gap out these regions here adjacent to it. Okay, so this is the way you would make a quantum dot in bilayer graphene. All right. So this is extensively being studied as a potential platform for uh, qubits. Um, what I'll show you are STM experiments that give uh, advanced fundamental understanding of the bilayer graphene quantum dot states, right? So what we did is we used this tip pulsing technique I showed you before to, uh, to then uh, create a bilayer graphene quantum dot and we then image the states. Okay, so here are results. Um, this is a DIDV map of one of these quantum dot states. Uh, so this is taken at a specific uh, tip sample bias and a gate voltage configuration we then uh, keep the gate voltage the same and modulate the tip sample bias. And so what we see is an incre we increase the number of nodes that's consistent with the higher energy state. So, well, there are um, differences and similarities here, right? So similarities, every, we have our, our circular quantum dot structure. Uh, some differences, the internal structure of the state is it, it different. Um, so it turns out when we looked at the literature, my student and I, we found that, well, these type of structures have been studied a lot theoretically. So this is work that spans, I believe, a decade. And in, in all these works, these are theoretical works, the expectation was that these states were circularly symmetric, much like what we saw in graphene, monolayer graphene. That's clearly not what we saw in our experiment. So uh, how do we explain this? Well, we had to go back to the, the drawing board in some sense. So if we look at the mono, at the bilayer graphene uh, band structure in more detail, uh, that's the key to understanding our observation. And so here, what I show you is the simplest model to understand bilayer graphene, where only interlayer and interlayer hoppings are considered. You get a, a parabolic uh, band structure, so you get this circularly symmetric structure. Now, if you consider a, a more complicated model um, where you incorporate um, skew interlayer hopping terms, the, uh, this is depicted here, this is the unit cell. This is the unit cell of bilayer graphene with these two different considerations. And here what you get is this trigonally distorted uh, band structure, which now has this threefold symmetry uh, that we observe in our experiment, right? It's, it's similar to the symmetry we observe in our experiment. So this hints to us that we need to incorporate this consideration in trying to understand our uh, bilayer graphene quantum dot states. So that's what we did. So here is uh, data from our, our experiments. These are bilayer graphene quantum dot states at different energy. You can see that from the tip sample bias, same gate voltage. Um, my student performed a numerical type binding based calculation where we extracted The nature of these states actually matches quite well. So here in the center, we have a valley surrounded by three peaks, as we see here. For this state here, this pretzel-like looking state, we have a peak here in the center surrounded by uh, dips, 
we see in the experiment, okay? So we conclude that this trigonal distortion, uh, which is commonly ignored, but uh, currently it's becoming more and more uh, considered in the community, is critical for understanding the spatial behavior of Beiler graphene quantum dots. Now, uh, how could this affect bilayer graphene quantum dot transport? So uh, related transport experiments on bilayer graphene quantum dots found that the threefold symmetric uh, wave function that we saw has a, has a significant effect on the uh, charge filling behavior of these structures. So in this experiment, they measure conductance as charge is placed in the quantum dot. This is work from the Ensign group. And what they found is that there is an enhanced degeneracy as shown here at higher energies for uh, or higher filling number for the electrons in your quantum dot, which essentially is higher energies. And so what you get here are 12 uh, electrons per energy window. And this corresponds to the two valley, two spin, and three dips from the trigonal distortion in the band structure, okay? And on the right is a theoretical prediction from the same paper that shows that the quantum dot uh, degeneracy becomes threefold because of this, this feature. So this has uh, an important effect on how the electrons can be prepared in the uh, bilayer graphene quantum dot, right? We have a greater degeneracy, so that will affect how we could prepare the quantum state in these structures. And so I believe now a, a deeper understanding of bilayer graphene quantum dots exists thanks to the work of several groups, including our effort at UC Santa Cruz. Okay, so I'll move on now to our work on trilayer graphene quantum dots, uh, but perhaps this is a good point to see if there are any questions for the bilayer graphene work presented. Okay, looks like we're good then, so I'll just proceed. Okay, so now I'll, I'll just finish off with this, our, our discussion of our trilayer graphene quantum dot work. And so here, what I'll show is a different kind of orbital magnetic moment in these structures, okay? So uh, band inversion and broken time reversal or inversion symmetry of materials can lead to Berry curvatures, okay? And a Berry curvature behaves as an intrinsic magnetic field in the momentum space. And what it does, it creates a self-rotating wave packet as shown here and discussed in this very important review. Now, the Berry curvature is very important to characterize the global topological properties for materials uh, which exhibit intriguing transport responses such as quantum anomalous Hall effect and quantum spin Hall effect. These phenomena are studied extensively, right? Something that is less studied is the consequence of this, this orbital magnetic moment um, in in confined spaces, okay, or confined geometries such as a quantum dot, okay. In such structures, the local momentum space geometry will manifest as a topological orbital magnetic moment. And um, these moments are, uh, and the, the related effects are, are absent in, in extended systems and just sheets of, of say, uh, bilayer graphene or TMDs. However, they're gonna dominate the quantum properties of quantum dots. Um, so here's uh, some work that's already been done by uh, the Ensign group where they probed um, the impact of this type of physics in bilayer graphene quantum dots. And what they found was a large Zeeman-like valley splitting, um, which can be stated as this valley G factor, right? So they get values that are much larger than the spin G factor, right? Which is two. So intrigued by this phenomena and its potential impact on QISC, we investigated trilayer graphene quantum dots with sublattice resolution resolved STM and STS. Okay, so here we have our um, kind of our structure. So we have by adding an additional sheet to bilayer graphene, you get burnout stacked ABA trilayer graphene, another highly versatile quantum material. Um, so this is the the unit cell of this system, it has a uh, mirror symmetry across the center. Now a type binding theory uh, shows that the band structure of trilayer graphene hosts monolayer graphene and bilayer graphene bands. And that's what I show here. The blue bands correspond to 
a gapped monolayer graphene band. And the red bands correspond to uh, gapped and triggeringly warped bilayer graphene bands. Okay, this calculation here was very nicely provided by our theory collaborators. Now, um, the, these, in these bands, we have uh, the, the electrons, because of this, these gaps here, the electrons will have um, this berry curvature. They'll have finite berry curvature. So they'll have this self-rotating effect that I discussed before. So what you'll have are orbital magnetic moments in each one of these valleys, the K and K prime valleys that are oriented in opposite directions. This is depicted by these white arrows. And, and so um, in trilayer graphene, very uniquely, we have access to these uh, orbital magnetic moments, these topological orbital magnetic moments. And it, it's quite interesting because we could access the monolayer moments and we could also access the bilayer moments. Okay. Okay. So how do we do this? Well, to, to study this system, we use a different type of quantum dot compared to the previously discussed experiments. Uh, previous STM studies showed uh, by, by, uh, on graphene by the NIST group and by the Morgenstern group showed that the, the STM tip itself can create a local, uh, local doping in your graphene sheet. And so this occurs because of the work function mismatch between your STM tip and graphene. And, and in the work by the NIST group, what they used this for was to detect whispering gallery modes in their uh, graphene uh, devices. We could do something similar for trilayer graphene. So we use the, um, the influence of the tip electric field due to the work function mismatch between the tip and trilayer graphene. And focusing on the embedded monolayer graphene band in our trilayer graphene system, what we'll have is a situation like this, where we could have a, a, a quantum dot state uh, for this gapped monol embedded monolayer graphene band. Okay, this state would be value degenerate um, as shown here. All right, so how do we probe this? Well, we use our uh, STM uh, to do very sensitive point spectroscopy that is sublattice resolved. So we could access the different sublattice atoms in our trilayer graphene system. Here on the right, I show point spectroscopy at these different positions, and we see very nicely at A1, a very strong peak. Okay, so a very strong peak exists in the A1 sublattice. This feature corresponds to a quantum dot state from the monolayer graphene band embedded in the trilayer graphene system, and this would be our focus now. Okay, so we're studying that state, and now uh, we increase the magnetic field of this quantum dot state. And so we find at, at low magnetic fields, we have one peak, but as we increase the magnetic field, we see a splitting of this peak. Okay. We could explain this splitting with a simple uh, picture that it invokes a, a, a Zeeman-like effect. So in, in the absence of this magnetic field, we have these uh, this degenerate valley states. When we apply a magnetic field, we'll have splitting of these uh, valley states, which we could understand by using this relationship here. V is the magnetic field we're applying, mu B is the Bohr magneton, and G nu here is the valley G factor. Okay, we could extract delta E by looking at the splitting peak uh, separation there. Okay. So by doing this, what I show here is uh, DIDV, second order derivative, as a function of tip sample bias and magnetic field. So this is a higher resolution image compared to what I showed you before. And um, here the red corresponds to uh, a peak and the blue a dip. And so from this measurement, we could perform a fit to get the value G factor and we arrive at an exceptionally large value, right? So a thousand, right? This is much larger than the spin value factor. Uh, the spin G factor. All right, so we could understand this value by considering um, that the orbital magnetic moment embedded in the monolayer, uh, by considering the orbital magnetic moment of the embedded monolayer graphene band in the trilayer graphene system. So here's a calculation of that orbital magnetic moment. And the physics is, can be understood in this very simple way. Essentially, this is inversely proportional to the effective mass 
of the, the electrons. And so uh, for the embedded monolayer graphene band in this trilayer graphene, graphene system, the effective mass is going to be very small, okay? And so with this in mind, we can then calculate the uh, value G nu factor and we'll get a large value G nu factor. All right, so really it's captured by this physics right here. Okay, so this shows, um, I, I think this is quite interesting because it shows that trilayer graphene could be uh, a, a, a quantum device with uh, very interesting properties. All right, so I can see that I'm, I'm well over 45 minutes, so I'll, I'll conclude here. Um, what I show are uh, results on different types of quantum dot devices, monolayer graphene and bilayer graphene and trilayer graphene. In monolayer graphene, we see giant uh, orbital magnetic moment splitting in our individual dots, uh, which can be used potentially as a new magnetic field sensor modality. Uh, we could couple these quantum dots and explore uh, relativistic quantum phenomena. Right here, we see the suppression of these orbital magnetic moments. In trilayer graphene, we see broken rotational symmetry quantum dot states uh, that, and this, this helps advance bilayer graphene quantum dots towards quantum information science and engineering applications. And finally, in trilayer graphene, we see giant valley uh, splitting. And this shows that this, is a, this could be an interesting platform for uh, quantum devices. So I just have two more slides left. Just an outlook, a very brief outlook. So this, this is a very exciting and fulfilling field to work in because there's a, a balance of development of potential applications with the study of fundamental science. There are several material platforms that are currently being studied for the development of future quantum technologies. Um, although I'm a big fan of 2D materials, as you could probably tell, um, I believe that future quantum technologies will likely use different materials that leverage the strengths of each material platform. I think 2D materials uh, will become more important or more prominent in this field due to the scalability of these materials, their integrability, and their low dimensionality. Additionally, they host very unique uh, degrees of freedom and quantum phenomena that is not found in these other systems. Okay, so with that, I'll just uh, acknowledge all my uh, collaborators in, in the works that I showed. So this work was spearheaded, um, the, the monolayer graphene work and the trilayer graphene work was spearheaded by Jehal Ge, a senior stu graduate student in my group, and uh, Sergei Sosovsky, um, a postdoctoral scholar in the group of Vladimir Falco at, at, at University of Manchester. The bilayer graphene work was done by this team of three, and uh, it, it was, uh, we had conversations with Tony Lowe's group at University of Minnesota. We had a lot of support from our computational cluster here for our simulations. And this work was supported by the uh, Army Research Office and the NSF and the UC Office of the President. Thank you for your attention and time. Yeah, thanks a lot for a really nice talk. Um, we already have some questions, but we can have a few more. So uh, any questions from the audience? I had one one simple one maybe to start with. So maybe I, I somehow wasn't hearing right. But so basically these defects, uh, you get them wherever you happen to have a child, wherever you happen to have a right kind of the impurity in the first place. So or can you somehow manipulate or make these these uh, these pairs? Or how does it work? So the hexagonal bore nitride here is is thick. So it's usually 10, 20 nanometers, even thicker. So you have uh, a, a good sized crystal here. And the idea here is that there are defects that you're accessing by doing this pulsing technique. So our, our thought is that the, the defects are there and we're just turning them on by doing this pulsing technique. We're not implanting them. We just think that they're there. Yeah. It is a, a very interesting avenue to pursue in the future though, to intentionally implant defects in, in HBN and and kind of play around with their charge state, yeah. And and there's like a sort of useful number of them that you can randomly find nice pairs and, and so on. That's like, what we think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we think that there's enough that we could make these potentials. Um, that's what we think at the moment. Now, there could be influence from the interface as well. 
like the interface of HBN and silicon dioxide, that could be playing a role. Um, but we have, um, it's not shown here, but uh, work that I did when I was a postdoctoral scholar in the Chromie group, we, we actually image um, charge defects in hexagonal boron nitride by using graphene as an imaging tool, right? It, it, you know, essentially the graphene electrons would swarm positive HBN defects and repel, be repelled by negative HBN defects. And so you would see this as bright and dark spots in the in DIDV maps. So they're there and we're able to tune them by applying electric fields. So we believe they play a prominent role in this process here. All right, thanks. Um, uh, Fabian first. Yes, I was wondering, I assume because the lateral shape of the quantum dot will depend on the electric field experienced by the boron nitride from a tip. So I assume the lateral shape should sort of depend on the macroscopic tip shape. Do you see there any kind of correlations? Do you have to have a nice symmetric tip or a sharp tip or a blunt tip to get nice quantum dots? Do you see there any kind of systematic correlations? Yes, absolutely. So the microscopic tip is very important. The preparation of the microscopic tip is very important to get nice symmetric potentials. Um, and so uh, my group goes through a lot of efforts to, 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 to shape the microscopic tip. The way we do this is we have a gold 111 crystal surface that we, we poke and pulse on until we get a, a nice uh, shape from a poke and we get the gold 111 surface state. So once we have these two conditions, then we move on to our graphene devices and, and do all the work that I just showed you. So indeed, if, if the tip, what we found is if the tip is, if, if it's not symmetric, when you poke into the gold, if it's not symmetric, you get weird potentials. They may not be, uh, they're slightly off in how circular they are, but also they're not as uniform. Okay, Does this thanks. answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, then there's a question in the chat from Amok. So uh, could you please comment on why in the last results you showed the B field level splitting in trilayer graphene was not linear, but more like a square root? Good, yes, yes, yes. Very good observation. So that's right. Um, it starts off linear, but then it starts to taper off. So here we believe what's going on. And in our paper, we have a, a data set that's larger in bias and larger in magnetic field. So we believe here what's going on is that the Landau level physics is starting to take over. Okay, that's why we're seeing this turnover uh, to uh, square root of N. Okay, so um, indeed when we, I don't have it on me right, now, and I don't have it in my supplement slides, but if you, if you look at this paper with larger magnetic field uh, range and larger bias range, you'll see clear Landau level for uh, uh, features on the, you know, on the extended region. All right, and then there was another other question in the chat that I, I kind of bypassed, but uh, from Zamin, so is the tip induced confinement transient? And if this is the case, I, I assume that keeping the tip on the surface will result in, in formation of a depletion zone, which might alter the local orbital momentum. Is that correct? Well, I don't know what you mean by transient. Um, in, I mean, it, it moves with the tip, right? So this, this, this potential, this kind of, um, let's see, maybe this slide more appropriate. This type of uh, potential, a profile will move with the tip. It's not like the BN charge potential that I spoke about for in the earlier slides, uh, which is static. This, yeah, this just travels with the tip. And as long as your tip is engaged um, and the work function doesn't change for your tip or your, your sample, it, it should still be there. So I, I don't think it's, it's transient, uh, unless I misunderstood the question. Um, it, it's just not static. That's what I would say. It's not static. Yeah, maybe Zamin can let us know if this answered the question or not. But in the meantime, there was one more question that uh, what will happen if we use a spin polarized tip? 
Yeah, so that's a great question, and that's something that we're working on. So we're preparing mm -hmm. uh, spin. We're going to prepare spin polarized tips, and um, yeah, we're very much interested in in, in studying, um, you know, any spin physics in these in these structures, um, and, and I, I think. Yeah, that's that's certainly something that we're we're going to be working on in the next uh, couple of years. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think this will be very. Uh, so this is something else I could say. Uh, we're we're also interested in realizing these structures in topological insulators, and there, right? It's spin momentum locking, and so we think that uh, a spin polarized tip will very, be very powerful for looking at the the physics of those structures. All right. Any final questions? Okay, maybe not. So I think let's thank uh, Jairo once more. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your time. It was a lot of fun.